Welcome to another edition of Pause for Thought with me, Greg. We're continuing our thoughts and reflections on our relationship with God. And today we start with John chapter 15, beginning at verse 5. I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And all too often in our lives, we are independent, we're self-motivated and want to be in control and in charge of everything. And sometimes that slips into, well, I don't need God's help in this. I can sort it myself. But it clearly says here that we are just branches. And elsewhere it says those branches that don't bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, will be cut off and thrown to the fire. He then goes on and says, whoever abides in me and I in him. And this is the presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Because by nature, we're sinful. We're not the full package. We have potential, but that potential can only come when we work at it to repent of the things which are not of light, but of dark, self, anger, resentment, hatred, unforgiveness, all those things, stealing, murder, lust. And the Holy Spirit brings those to mind, and as we repent of them, the blood of Jesus cleanses us and forgives us, and we move a little bit closer in our relationship to God and abide in him, and then he is able to abide in us because God is a holy God. Then it says, if we abide in him and he in us, we will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to remember that a branch receives all the sap, all the energy, everything it needs to survive and flourish from the vine. And the father, uh, says, is the gardener who prunes and tends so that much fruit is brought about. And this brings us to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And people who are proud, and remember proud, pride was the sin of Satan for which he was cast out and for which he will ultimately be uh, brought to judgment. The opposite of that is humility, but not false humility, a humility that's built on reality for a start off, that without God we can do nothing. But this humility here is under the mighty hand of God. So it's seeking the Lord with all your heart and strength and soul and mind, allowing the word of God to renew your mind so that you think differently and think in line with what it says in God's word. And then his mighty hand will guide you, and at the proper time, you will be rewarded. It's rather like the parable of the wedding feast, and it talks about humility. Don't take the best place in the wedding feast. 
because the bridegroom might come along and say, you're not sitting in the right place, go and sit at the back and call somebody else to sit at the front and you'll be humiliated. But it's much preferable, preferable to be called up to go higher than it is to be sent lower. And because it clearly states that we can do nothing apart from the Lord, this reading says there, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And a relationship is a conversation. It's love. It's sharing. Sometimes it's complaining. Sometimes it's requests. And he wants to hear. But sometimes we ask out of selfish motives. And we wonder why God doesn't answer. In James 4, 6 to 10, he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Because this is a spiritual battle. God opposes pride, and he always has done. But he gives grace and help and support and guidance and blessing to those who are humble, who seek his face. And that comes by submitting ourselves to God. He knew you and knit you together in your mother's womb, even before you were born. He decided to create you. People think submission is a sign of weakness, like obedience, but actually it's freedom. And when you do this, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In this spiritual battle, we tend to give in too easily. But all we have to do is resist. No. And use the tools that God has given. Remember Jesus in the wilderness. How did he resist the devil? Because he used scripture and says, the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. When he was tempted to turn the rocks into, into bread, even though he was really, 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 really hungry. And so if we resist the devil and he flees, if we draw near to God, he draws near to us. But there's a warning. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. God sees everything. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at our heart. He doesn't want our sacrifices and or, or anything we have to offer because our sins are like filthy rags and our offerings are nothing. What he wants is a humble and broken and contrite heart that has reality about our sin, purifies our hearts, allows the word of God to give us single-minded minds and turn our false lives into repentance. And then at the right time, like it said in the previous scripture, he may exalt you. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So this is a call to be a peculiar people, 
the called out ones different. And some people will be threatened by it. Some people will not like it. But the love of the Father says, you are my children. You are part of my family. And I love you. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. When you're part of a family, yes, there will be tensions. Yes, there'll be difficulties. Yes, there'll be things that we have to deal with. But when it comes to the crunch and one of the family is under attack, we stand together in unity. Remember on the day of Pentecost, they were commanded to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And they were in an upper room, locked inside for fear that they might be the next ones to be persecuted and killed. But they were of one mind, in one place, praying and seeking the Lord in obedience. And then the Lord himself and the Holy Spirit turned up. Parable for us. In 1 Timothy 6, starting at verse 12, it says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you make the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Being a Christian is not easy, particularly as we're in a spiritual battle between our selfish inner parts and the holy life that we're called to. But as we do this, and as we battle, remember we don't battle against people, but principalities, powers, and spiritual beings in high places. And our testimony is powerful, because it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, so how God changed us from the inside out, it's that that makes a difference. It goes on, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Some people believe and see that the Old Testament is not for Christians. But if you look at it, read it, study it, you'll find that the word of God, old and new, is one. And without one or the other, they are incomplete. Because the explanation of one is in the other. And that God is consistent in what he says and what he does. And he's always had a plan to prosper and bless. And in the proper time, if we live our lives as we were designed to live them, to be a blessing, to be repentant and humble, to be a holy people set aside to our God. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable life, whom no one has ever seen or can see, then to him be honour and eternal dominion forever. Amen. Because he is worthy of all praise and honour. You know, that the astronomers are consistently being shaken to their foundations when they realise that there are billions more galaxies than our own. Then they send another probe, and then they realise there are trillions more galaxies than our own. Who is this God who created it all? beyond our imagination and understanding, that, that's for sure. So to be proud is just 
ridiculous. And finally, Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The Lord has prepared a path for us to walk in so that that relationship with him may be restored that was lost in the beginning through the deception of the snake and the weakness of Adam and Eve in their disobedience. Remember that scripture from John 3.16. God so loved the world, that you and I, that he sent his only begotten son, that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved because he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and desires eternity with you. So make sure you choose right while he may be still found. So until next time, it's a big God bless you from me, Greg. Bye. <laughs>